My name is Colleen Klimczak. Um, I am a certified professional organizer. Um, I am a member of NAPO and NAPO Chicago, the National Association of Productivity and Organizing Professionals. Um, I apparently much prefer to do this at a library because doing it from here is strange, but I'm willing to give it a whirl, so um, thank you. Um, so Blue Island was kind enough, Blue Island Public Library was kind enough to um, ask to collaborate on, um, or really host, um, my regularly scheduled but then canceled uh, presentation on Tuesday, this coming Tuesday, for um, paper management. But we thought that perhaps it would be a good idea to give it a try um, before the 90 minute presentation on Tuesday. And so you are all helping us out with that today. So um, the, the 30 minutes today is a preface for the 90 minutes on Tuesday and I do hope that you consider joining us again. Um, so um, most days I go into people's homes and offices and help them get organized. Obviously things are a little different these days and that's okay, um, but thankfully the process to get organized is going to be the same whether I'm doing it with you or you're doing it yourself. And um, so today I just want to spend maybe 30 or 40 minutes talking through the process so you will have tools and ideas um, as you tackle these projects in your home on your own. I've been hearing from a lot of people lately about uh, tackling those organizing projects when we're stuck. I mean, really, we're stuck at home. So um, might as well use this time productively to take care of those things. So, um, so that's what we're here to do today. Um, I hope that's what will be beneficial to you. Um, I know it will be beneficial um, to all of us to give this a whirl. And if you do have questions, we do have a chat box at the bottom. I believe everybody's muted, um, but I will try to field questions at the end if that help is helpful to everybody. So um, almost every organizing conversation starts out with clearing clutter. And so clearing clutter is what we'll talk about today. Um, so we're gonna talk about paper on on Tuesday, which is very specific, obviously, to our paper challenges. But the clear the clutter um, process that we're going to walk through today is actually one that you can use anywhere in your home, whatever your projects are, whether it's an entire room. Um, you guys don't know it, but you're standing in my bedroom. So whether it's an entire room or it's an entire basement or garage, or if it's just one drawer or one kitchen cabinet, you know, it could be, it doesn't matter how big or small, it's the same process which makes it a lot nicer because you never have to get that deer in the headlights look as in, I don't know what to do, I don't know where to start, you know, and so then we close the door and leave the room again instead of ever actually getting the progress and that, that progress made. So hopefully we will, um, I will provide the tools to make that happen. So um, I mentioned that almost every organizing conversation starts with clearing clutter. So the best place to start then too is identifying what specifically is clutter, right? So what makes one pile of things on the dining room table clutter and what makes the other pile of things on the dining room table not clutter? So, and you could say dining room table, but we could also say what? Kitchen counter, um, desktop, uh, the floor in the garage by the door. How am I doing? Some of those hot spots in our homes like the mystery piles so again what makes one pile of things clutter and one pile of things not clutter so clutter is anything that we don't need use or love we don't need something we don't use it and we don't love it then it's probably clutter if you've ever found yourself looking at something and you get these 11s in your forehead like i didn't realize this camera thing like you know but if you get the creases in your forehead because you're looking at something because you cannot figure out where it came from, where it's going, who even brought it in the house, what in the world is it doing here? Those are all indicators that they are probably that item might be clutter. Okay, so if it's something that we don't need, use, or love, and it's not loving us back anymore, it is most likely clutter. So um, there's a woman who's considered the matriarch of the organizing professional. And her name is uh, Barbara Hemphill. And she would say that clutter is unmade decisions. So very often, those piles of things that are at various places in your home, um, we haven't decided where they're supposed to go, who they belong to, where the away is. Like if you can't put it away because it doesn't have a home, then 
it just kind of floats around your house, right? So we want to have um, a way to identify what is clutter and what's not clutter and then actually put things away and that is what we'll talk about too. So clutter is unmade decision tells us that sometimes we need to decide if the item is going to stay or go completely. And if it is going to stay, we need to decide then where, where in our home do we want it to stay, okay? So clutter is often unmade decision. Um, some of the other problems with clutter other than the obvious is, yeah, it's unsightly. It bugs us. It gets in the way. We have to step over it to get into our closet or, you know, get to the laundry room or whatever. But it also covers up the things that we do need and we do use and we do love. So if in the bottom of your closet you have a whole hot mess of shoes and boots and you cannot find your favorite shoes because you know they're at the bottom of that somewhere, then that's the other problem with clutter is it covers up the stuff that we do need and we do use and we do love. So in the paper management class that we might talk about on Tuesday, um, somewhere in that pile of papers on the dining room table is the one from ComEd with the angry red writing this month, right? So you know you really need to do something with it, but now you can't find it because it is underneath all of that clutter. So like I said, clutter is, um, it's, it bugs us to begin with, but it also covers up the stuff that we do need and we do use and we do love. And that makes it, um, makes us feel overwhelmed and out of control. And um, it makes us want to leave that space and go somewhere else. And now guess what? We don't have that choice. <laughs> we don't get to leave and go somewhere else anymore because, um, oh yeah, sheltering in place. So uh, we need to address that challenge and that clutter if it's driving us crazy and, um, and send the clutter packing and find in a way for the things that we do decide we want, okay? So that's what we want to get to are the things that we do want to keep, the things that we do use and we do love, right? Need, use, and love. We want to keep the stuff that we do need, use, and love, and then part with the rest of them, okay? So look around your house. We've all got a little clutter, right? All of us, even me. I will, I will own it. I've got the backdrop, but I, one of these days, maybe I will be willing to give you a tour. And you know, we have clutter. We all do. Um, but what we can do with it is our choice. And how we can address it is our choice, okay? Now, let me say too, we all have stuff. So some stuff is stuff and some stuff is clutter. So I definitely have stuff, but I don't have much clutter. So again, differentiating which those are. When we are organized, meaning why we should get organized, we can be responsible of what we have, okay? We can share our excess with others. We can live more comfortably in our space. We can be safer in our space, okay? So sometimes clutter poses health issues. If it is, um, you know, again, a tripping hazard or, you know, in our way to stumble over to get to something else, then that's clutter that's actually going to cause us trouble. And we want to send that on its way too, okay? So um, we want to, like I said, we want to be more organized. We want to take better care of what we have. We want to live more comfortably in our space, especially right now. And um, it may be hard to realize, but our clutter is actually costing us money, okay? So sometimes we have things that need to be repaired or replaced. We have the ultimate, someday I'm going to fix that lamp or those lamps and there they sit. Do I, I don't know how to fix a lamp. Now granted, maybe I have time now to check YouTube and I could learn, but Maybe it's also time to part with that clutter or maybe hand it over to somebody who does know how to do those things, okay? Um, if we have clutter, we might not have room for other things. So if that shelf is being taken up by something that's old and not very useful, we don't have rooms to put, don't have room to put something that is useful on that shelf, okay? There's only so much space that we have in our homes. Um, maybe we have storage units that we're paying for. Um, things like that, our clutter does actually cost us money. And so clearing that clutter clears those, that anxiety, it clears the mental clutter, the stress, the overwhelmed, et cetera, and it lets us get to what is more reasonable and um, manageable, okay? Now, I can say all of this I want, but I know sometimes clearing clutter is really hard. 
if it wasn't hard, you guys wouldn't be here with me at two o'clock in the afternoon on a Saturday because it's easy and it would already be done, right? But clutter is hard sometimes to part with. So what if, or have you ever heard, I can't get rid of that because I spent money on it. That's money, that's inventory. Or I might need it some day. Or it was a gift. Or just in case, how am I doing? Yeah, sound familiar? Okay. Um, and unfortunately, clearing clutter does not come naturally for all of us. So uh, it comes like, I can do it, but it's not, it's sometimes a skill and it's sometimes a talent. It can be taught, it can be learned, but it also might not be something that we regularly do because honestly, we're not always called upon to do it. So, um, so it's hard. It's not always something that people just know how to do. So that's why we're here is let's talk through the process and make it easier um, and give you guys some questions to ask yourself when you're standing in your closet or your laundry room and um, hopefully make that process uh, go more smoothly. So the first thing that I want you to do if you um, have some projects to tackle is I want you to grab a clipboard. I have very pretty clipboards. I love my clipboards. So um, now this is where doing this alone is really hard, Stephanie, because I love sharing my clipboard with the class because I am such a fan of them. And now I'm realizing the shortfalls of this. But so the point is, um, we grab a clipboard because everybody feels more empowered and potentially taller when they're carrying a clipboard, right? Don't we all? Maybe just me. Um, what I want you to do is grab a clipboard or a notebook or even your phone. If you want to, you know, write it in, I use Evernote or um, you could dictate it into notes or things like that. But what we want to do first is we want to craft our organizing plan, okay? So the easiest ways to derail your organizing projects are to first of all, start without a plan. And secondly, to go buy or um, containers before you actually know what you need. So don't do that either, okay? Don't go shopping until we're further along in the process. So first things first, we need to craft our organizing plan. And that's when I want you to grab your clipboard, okay? So I want you to walk around your house even if you want to do this mentally, you can sit at the dining room table with a cup of coffee and you can mentally walk around your house. That's fine too. Um, but I want you to walk around your house and I want you to think about all of your different spaces. And I want you to start to jot down the things that you would like to see happen in those different spaces. So um, I actually have this in my, um, in my master to-do list, which I actually just talked about in my blog the other day. Um, I have it and it's called the clipboard list because this is exactly what I do every season to come up with the things that I want to take care of too, okay? So things that are on the clipboard list for me are go through the top drawer of my business file cabinet. I filed something in there the other day. My entire business is contained in one small drawer of an Ikea file cabinet. But guess what? It's getting a little tight. So. Um, in this time that we have, right, I'm going to dedicate an hour and I'm going to tackle that um, file cabinet, turn on my shredder and just start feeding it things that are obsolete. We'll talk about that with the paper management class, I guess, in a couple days. But other things that might be on the clipboard list, um, you know, one of my sons wanted a loft bed and we did that and now he wants um, maybe some new bedding. Okay, so new bedding is on my clipboard list. Um, Things that I wanted to do, I'm trying not to share too much uh, personal incriminating information about my family members. So um, moving the DVDs from my office down to the basement. Okay, um, we don't really watch DVDs anymore. So they don't need to be up in the family room. I could use that shelf space for other things. I wanna put them on the shelves in the basement. Okay, so that kind of thing would be on the clipboard list, okay? and. Congratulations, as you start to craft that clipboard list from room to room, you have just created your organizing plan, okay? So we look at what we have, we look at what we'd like it to be, we figure out what the steps are to get us from here to there, and we jot those down on our clipboard, okay? 
So I have a client that I've been working with and I've been managing her clipboard list for her and then I send it to her um, as an attachment every week after we speak. And you know, she's realizing that new bookshelves in the basement need, mean that she has to actually clear the space where the bookshelves will be. Okay, so both of those items need to be on that clipboard list. But again, this is how we craft our plan, right? So we um, grab that clipboard, we itemize the projects, okay? And then we pick one to start. One to start. One. <laughs> Do not take apart every room as you start these projects, okay? You are all my witnesses and we are recording this. So no one can come back at me and say, hey, I made a big hot mess and took apart every room. I did not tell you to do that. No, one spot. So the benefit of picking just one project, there's a couple of them, but the main one I think is we give our mental energy to that project until it's done, okay? And that helps us to keep from feeling so frazzled and pulled and out of sorts. Okay, so if we know that if we have maybe an hour to dedicate to these projects every day, and maybe that's, maybe that's what we've got these days, right? Because we've got the time, who knows? Um, it gives us a place to pick back up again tomorrow, okay? It gives us a time to pause and we get enough done today and then we can move on to something else. But we know we're coming back to that tomorrow. And again, that keeps us from taking apart every room and making our house a bigger mess. Um, instead of clearing the clutter and taking care of those projects, okay? So we wanna pick just one place to start. Now, if you are wondering, after you're looking at your clipboard list, well, I've got 10 projects on here, Cal, how do I know which one to start with, okay? Which is a very fair question. So the first answer is, it doesn't matter. Usually starting is the hardest part, and so if we could just start on one of them, we'll be halfway there. Now the second answer to that question of where to start is, let's say you've got four big projects that you wanna tackle. So they are the attic, um, the garage, the kitchen, and the hall closet. So maybe that's a hand linen closet, maybe it's the coat closet, whatever the hall closet means to you. So um, let me tell you this, that the attic has been there for 20 years and it's not going anywhere. So if you've got those four projects to choose from, the attic, while it is important, it might not be terribly urgent. So it can stay, it can stay on the list, but it's probably pretty down, down the bottom, to the bottom of the list. Honestly, if I had those four projects to tackle, I would probably choose either the kitchen or the hall closet first. And I would do that because those are gonna be the projects that are gonna help everybody in the house the quickest. All right, so if you have those projects on your list, choose one that's gonna help everybody quickest, or um, so gives you the most to gain, or maybe there's one that you need to solve because it's causing you pain. Um, if there's pain, maybe it's, wow, I've gotta have the plumber out because there's a leak under the sink. So tackling under the sink in the kitchen is gonna be your first project because it's gonna help you solve that. It's gonna help you um, alleviate that pain and have the plumber out, okay? So if you're trying to figure out which project to start on first, think about either which one gives you the most gain or which one alleviates the biggest pain, okay? So those are a couple things to think about when you're choosing those. Um, and then the other, the third answer to the I don't know where to start question is um, start left to right, top to bottom. Doesn't matter. We just need to start, okay? And so if we start and we tackle a project left to right or a room left to right or top to bottom, it just gives us a way to tackle those projects consistently. And we're more likely, again, to, keep, to stick with it. And we start to exercise our organizing muscles and we get really good at this, okay? So we pick a way and we, we do it the same way every time because then we get used to it and it becomes a habit. And that's really good news, okay? So we have grabbed our clipboard, we have jotted down our projects, we have picked it, that's the cat. We have picked our one, <laughs> um, our one place to start. Um, the next thing I want you to do is to um, grab a cold beverage or warm, 
maybe. There, I have my water. And I had something too, so you reminded me. Um, so you grab something to drink. There you go. Um, you do not turn on the television because we are distracted by shiny screens and do not turn on the television. That is not a good partner for organizing, but good music would be, okay? Assemble your tools. So garbage bags, post-it notes, um, a Sharpie, um, some, um, maybe some boxes for donations and things like that. So go ahead and collect all those things. Um, set an, a timer on your phone, maybe an hour, um, if you think you can do that much. Most people don't like to do this more than two or three hours. My, most of my sessions in home are only two or three hours. Um, so we are ready, right? We've got all of our tools. We've got our place to start. Let's do this. Um, what I want you to do as you actually tackle the project. So first things first is we clear out the obvious. And what do I mean by that? So very often, let's say we were organizing a bedroom. Um, we may have piles of things that we've already decided are going to go away. Maybe we have bags of donations that need to be dropped off. Maybe we have some shoes that we want to donate. Maybe we have um, a pile of clothes that need to go to the cleaners or to your sister-in-law who likes them better than you do or who knows, right? But very often we have things that are already decided, already slated to go away. And so my suggestion is to start with that and get those on their way immediately. Um, if you were in your kitchen, it's very possible that you already have some things that, um, you know, just yesterday I dropped off a plate of cookies to a friend and a container to a friend of cookies. We had received things from both of them, but now I had a random plate and a random container sitting in my kitchen. So yes, I was able to share cookies, which is always a good thing, but it also got the containers that didn't have a home in my kitchen out of my kitchen. So this was a good thing. Um, other things could be, again, you know, recycling or just trash or, you know, things to be returned to other people, whatever that might be. So clearing that stuff out first and maybe just, you know, go ahead and drop it off or putting it in the car to be dropped off later. Um, you're already clearing clutter, which is awesome. Okay. So now you could also, if you tend to get distracted, you can also just put those things by the door we don't want to get distracted because it might be hard to get back if we get distracted that can happen i know um but um sometimes we can just set them by the door and know that our last 10 minutes of the session will be taking those to the different places that they belong that kind of thing okay so um if again you're doing your bedroom or your closet maybe it's dirty laundry like go ahead and get that stuff downstairs and drop it off and bring the basket back up you know for more all that kind of stuff you're already clearing clutter and making more space in that place that you're trying to tackle, okay? Now, we also may need to decide on where our stuff is going to go. So maybe you know that there are things that need to leave, but you're not sure where they need to go just yet. So um, I actually have a website. It's called peaceofmindpo.com. And I have in my blog articles, I have a resources page. So if you have things and you are wondering where to donate them or recycle them, et cetera, you can go to my website, again, peaceofmindpo.com and check on the resources page. And I know that there's information in the Chicago area about e-waste and medication recycling and um, textile recycling and books and coins and all kinds of things like that. So if you are curious as to where things might need to go, then um, that might be a resource for you. Um, I know that it's a little slippery right now because a lot of donation places aren't open, right? So it's harder to actually get them to their destination. But that doesn't mean that we can't make the decisions now since decision-making is the big part of, right? Clutter's on made decisions. So we wanna go ahead and make the decisions. Maybe you just have a, a big stockpile, you know, after these projects in the garage. Um, I often recommend using uh, white kitchen garbage bags because you can draw on those with a Sharpie. So you can say where those are slated to go, maybe where their destination is. So by all means, make the decisions and bag them up 
and put them somewhere. And then when we can all get out and run our errands again, we will drop those things off where they're supposed to go. So that will be a good thing. Um, but again, don't let that keep you from making the decisions. By all means, make those decisions. And then um, again, when, when it's ready, when we can again, we can drop those things off where they go, okay? So um, what motivates you is sometimes a question that people can ask when they are wondering what to do with their clutter or their stuff. So if there is a, um, a not-for-profit organization that appeals to you, um, I'm gonna be doing a project with the Paws and Tinley. Um, one of my Eagle Scouts is gonna be doing a project out there. And if, you, if animals are something that appeals to you, then, and donating for a good cause, then when you find uh, extra cleaning supplies or old linens or t-shirts or things like that, towels, put them in a bag for Tinley or for Paws and call me. <laughs> And when the project starts, I'll come and get them. Um, but sometimes having a destination that appeals to us in, in mind helps us to keep, um, it helps us to keep those, uh, make that, that, those ideas happen. Um, and it keeps us motivated. Um, and maybe we wanna sell it or sell it on consignment or have a garage sale or who knows, there's a lot of apps and things like that. Um, Oh, of course it just left me. Um, there was one for, you know, designer handbags. Like people have a lot of them and there's ways to, you know, sell those online. Awesome. Um, that's, that's a destination too. A little money in your pocket is a beautiful thing. Okay. So just some things like that. So when we're actually ready to start, um, there's a five-step process. And uh, if we were in the library, I would mention that this is by a woman named Julie Morgenstern, and most of our libraries have books by, by Julie Morgenstern. Um, she's awesome, and uh, she has an um, organization organizing process that's called SPACE, makes it really easy to remember, um, which makes it really simple every time I'm in a client's house or things like that. I never have to worry about where to start because this is how we start. And I do this in my own home and other people's homes and it just makes it. So the first thing that we do is we sort, okay? We sort like with like. So you're in my bedroom. If we were doing my closet right now, you would see that I am a categorical person. So all of my skirts are together and all my short sleeve shirts are together and all my sweaters are up on a shelf. And, and so I'm a category person. Um, I know other people might be um, color people. So they might have all of their blue things together and all of their black things together and all of their brown things together. Now, all of those are just right. Um, hey, Sabina. Um, so um, there is no wrong answer as to what works for you, okay? So knowing what works for you is a really good thing. Um, and that'll tell us how to sort. So if we were in our kitchen, then it would also be categorical, right? So it would be, you know, all of the baking dishes together, all of the pots and pans together, all of the um, canned goods together. I was just making my grocery list for tomorrow. So I was just looking at all of my canned goods um, like an hour, hour and a half ago. Um, so we sort how, what makes sense to us, okay? Um, like I said, categorical, if we're doing paper, it might be category, it might be um, chronological or alphabetical, so who knows, right? But the first thing that we do is we sort. And what's nice about that is once we start to put our hands on things and we start to sort things out, that starts to tell us maybe what we can do to purge, and purge is the next step. So just so um, you guys can know where I'm going, the acronym is SPACE, S-P-A-C-E. So that's Julie Morgenstern's acronym. First we sort, then we purge, we assign a home, that's the A, we containerize, that's the C, and then we equalize, which is her fancy word for maintenance. So that's where we're headed, all right? So first things first is we sort. Um, second, we purge. And sometimes we purge from the space completely, and sometimes it just, we purge from the space that we're working in. So I might come along, I might arrive at something and go, oh, well, I don't need to get rid of this, but it doesn't live in my room or in the kitchen, it belongs somewhere else. So like I said, sometimes we sort and we purge completely, and sometimes we purge just from the space that we're working in, okay? Now, I already said at the very beginning that purging is the hardest part. So let me give you four questions to ask yourself while you are purging, right? Because I know it's tough. 
Um, so we need to ask that question again that we asked at the beginning, what is clutter, right? Something we need, use, and love. So if we find something we don't need and we don't use and we don't love, maybe we can let it go, all right? So the first purge criteria that I want you to think about is, the, is duplicates. Duplicates, if you want to do this with me, um, I usually ask the question about mug math. And that question is how many mugs do you really need, right? So how many people drink coffee in my house? Just me. How many cups does she drink a day? Two. And how often do we run the dishwasher? Actually, right now, because everybody's home, we're running it like every day. So in theory, I need two mugs. Of course, I have more than two coffee mugs. I mean, come on. And just for the record, this is water. I know I've been talking for 33 minutes straight now, but this is not caffeinated. Okay. So do I have more than four mugs? Yes. Do I have 40? Have I, will I ever have 40 people drinking coffee in my house at the same time? No. If I have 40 people at my house, they are not drinking coffee. They are drinking something else. So, or they brought their own coffee mug. I'm just saying. Um, so do I want to make room in my kitchen cabinet for 40 coffee mugs if I'm never going to have 40 people drinking coffee in my house at the same time? So these are the kinds of questions of duplicates that we can ask ourselves, okay? How many of certain things do we need? Do we really need 20 or 30 of anything, right? And maybe the answer is yes. Maybe you do use them regularly. Maybe you do have 10 people every day for breakfast. I don't, I don't know. Um, but if you don't, then maybe you don't need to make room in your cabinet for 40 mugs that nobody ever gets through, okay? Um, I had a, a person in one of my classes I taught in uh, Naperville at the Park District, and there was a woman there who said her husband had a mug from each of the 50 states as souvenirs. So there were 50 mugs in the kitchen cabinets, but you weren't actually allowed to use them because they were souvenirs and not coffee mugs. So she had 50 mugs stored in her kitchen cabinets, and she wasn't allowed to use any of them. <laughs> so she, we instead discussed maybe we moved those out and actually did something with them so that she could, that if they were her husband's mugs, that he could enjoy them as a souvenir and it could get them out of the kitchen. Bed. So that's what we talked about is actually mounting them up on a wall so he could see them and that was great. Okay. So how many of certain things do we need? That's the duplicate question. All right. The next question that you can ask yourself is usefulness. Okay. There's actually something called the Pareto Principle, which is, um, it tells us that 80% of what we have, no, that 80% of what we need is in 20% of what we have. What do I mean by that? I mean, if you have 10 pairs of jeans, you probably wear the same two or three all the time. If you have 10 appliances in your kitchen, you probably use the same two or three all the time. Uh, if you have 10 pieces of mail that came in your mailbox today, you probably need to actually do something with two or three of them. And that means that the 80% that we don't use very often, it might not need to go away completely, but maybe that's some of the clutter that we aren't using, needing, using, or loving, and it can go away, okay? So usefulness talks about making the most of that 20% that we use all the time, and maybe then starting to part with the, some of the 80% that we don't use as often, okay? So usefulness is asking, do I actually use all of these different things, okay? So I talk a lot about, you know, organizing closets and things like that. So I look terrible in yellow. There you go. Um, so if I found something in my closet that was yellow, I will never, ever use it. It will never be my first, second, or even 10th choice, it just won't. And so I know that if I had that in my closet, it will never get used. And if it's not ever going to be used, then I don't need to make room for it. It doesn't need to be there, okay? So we wanna make sure that we have the things that we're actually gonna use, we wanna make room for those things, and we wanna part with things that are never gonna be our first or second or 10th choice. 
So I was actually talking to a friend the other day who's having a really hard time going through her books. We're, we're at a library, right? So how many people have problems getting rid of books, right? I mean, come on, me too. Yes, I know. So, um, but I gave her a new filter, okay? So stick with me. If you won't read it when you're sheltering in place for five weeks and it still isn't on your reading list, maybe it can go. Just saying. So there are books that I have looked at this week and I have said, nope, <laughs> I am still not ready to spend the time reading that book. And we're trapped in the house for the next four weeks and I still don't want to read it. So guess what? Those are probably not books that will mean that I will keep after this all is over, right? So, but then there are also some that some books that are near and that are friends, and I love them and I will never part with them. But it's just a new way to think about things. So if you're if there's something in your house that you're not going to use even when you're stuck inside your house for five weeks, maybe that's something that can certainly go. Okay. So usefulness. The third uh, criteria that you can ask yourself is about exceptions. So exceptions are things that we use once in a while, but not very often. So I mentioned, Greg and I were talking about uh, things that we love. And I have a really beat up, I mean, it is abused, uh, metal measuring cup that my grandmother had. And um, it's not good for much, there's actually holes in the bottom. So I use it when I make chocolate chip cookies and it's not even really a full cup anymore, I'm pretty sure. So I just have to add lots of extra cookies or chocolate chips to my cookies, but it makes me happy. So I have one thing in my kitchen and when I use it, it makes me happy. And of course we just made cookies. So it was out and in the, in the drain. So he and I were discussing the Mr. or Santa and Mrs. Claus salt and pepper shakers I have that were from his grandmother. And I love them. And every December 1st, they come out, but it is March 4th. Do I need to see Santa and Mrs. Claus in my kitchen right now? No, I don't. So that would be an exception. So something that I'm not going to use for another eight months, I'm not saying it has to go away completely, but it is certainly not something that I need to be seeing anytime soon right? So exceptions are great and they're important, but when my kids were littler, we used to have a, a rule about the seasons of sports. So if it was soccer season, then I expect to see soccer things out. That makes sense. So knee pad or shin guards and cleats and things like that. But did I expect to then see baseball stuff too? No, we don't have a big house. And I had three sons in all kinds of sports. So um, if it was baseball season, then it was all the baseball bags, but then I didn't, shouldn't be seeing all those other seasons of sports in the way, okay? So those were exceptions as well. So they don't need to leave completely, but maybe they just need to be put away. Um, for example, Santa and Mrs. Claus are carefully in my seasonal decor bins in my crawl space. And I will not see them again until around December 1st. I know where they are. They're fine. Um, but they're out of the way until then. So those are what, that's what we want to do with our exceptions. And then the fourth purge criteria, so what we can ask is we're trying to part with things, is shelf life. And that is the question, right? How long do things last? Some things really do expire. And I'm not just talking canned goods or food, right? Um, other things that expire are medications and toiletries and things like that. You know, if we find in the back of the linen closet shampoo from five years ago that's a little lumpy and discolored, please do not put that on your head, right? Who knows what could happen to your hair? And I don't want to be responsible for that. Um, but like I said, other things do expire, okay? And so we can certainly let those things go if they have expired. Um, broken things, um, I often have things that expire, meaning when my kids were littler, they went through sizes really, really quickly. So I had three sons, which is kind of easy because I would just pass it on to the next kid, right? So, but shelf life also means, does it expire to you? Maybe there are things that you have that have expired to you that might be helpful to somebody else, but maybe you're just ready to part with them, if that makes sense, okay? So um, other things that can expire, you know, maybe you have canned goods that you bought, then 
your family decided they didn't like? Anybody else go to Costco, buy 48 of something, and then they all decide they don't like it anymore? Anybody? Or is it just me? Just me. Okay. Um, but it happens. Um, not very often, though. They tend to eat almost anything. these days. Um, but sometimes we've gone to the doctor and he says, you need to eat low sodium. And so the stuff that we have in the canned goods aren't things that we need to eat anymore. So perhaps they've expired to us, but they're not expired to others, in which case we can certainly pass them on and let them be a blessing to somebody else, okay? But we don't need to keep them anymore, all right? So shelf life, things do expire. Um, like I said, something with expiration dates is easy to see. Um, clothing and stuff like that does expire, and I don't mean styles. I mean, I was working with a client back when I was still working with clients uh, three weeks ago, and we held up swimming suits and they crinkled. Like the, the elastic was so far gone that the actually like crinkled. Obviously, that swimming suit's not going to work for anybody anymore. So it went away. Okay. So things do expire. So consider shelf life. All right. So duplicates, usefulness, exceptions, and shelf life. Those are the questions that you can ask yourself while you're trying to purge your item. Okay. So first we sorted. Okay. Then we purged. And purging is hard. I know. So good for you. Okay. Get yourself on the back, right? Um, the third step after we have sorted and purged, well, there's like a two and a half. So the, the end of the purge step is to actually deliver the things where they're going, all right? So if you now have a bedroom and you've got like five donate bags sitting by the door, by all means, take them outside and put them in your trunk or put them in the garage because you deserve to see that clear space. You've done the hard work, now is the time. Okay, so um, after you've removed your purge, now we have to figure out how to store what's left. Now, very often things are gonna go right back where they came from, all right? If you take things out of the utensil drawer in the kitchen, the utensils that you're keeping will probably go back in the drawer, and that's okay. Um, things that came out of a, of a dresser drawer, you know, my sock drawer is still gonna be my sock drawer. It's not gonna change. It's a little roomier now, which is a good thing. So, um, but as you are assigning a home to things, you could also use this opportunity as a, as a chance, or uh, use this chance as an opportunity to put things in new places that might work better for you. For a very long time, I spent, I made sure that everything in my house was accessible to my kids when they were little, like they had coat hooks and everything was down on their level. And now I am the shortest person in my house because my sons are all taller than me. So um, I don't have to worry about that as much when I'm assigning a home to things. Um, but I do need to think about how often somebody's gonna use something. Um, if it's heavy, I certainly don't wanna store it above my head. I wanna be able to access it down low. Um, we need to think about those things as we're assigning a home to stuff, okay? So where to keep what's left, how you want to store it, how often will you use it? You know, we want to keep the regularly used stuff close at hand, okay? Now, assigning a home also goes hand in hand, I believe, with the next step, which is containerizing. And containerizing is now we actually get to go out and buy containers. However, I bet that as you've gone through some of this process, you've found containers in your home that you could repurpose for other things, okay? So very often as we go through, you know, big storage containers, we go through four of them and we get rid of some, some stuff and now we can combine them down into two, three, or maybe even two. So we might have things that we could use to containerize elsewhere in our home. Um, so we also need to think about, like I said, hand in hand with where you wanna store things is how you wanna store things. So things to consider when you're asking that where and how, right? Assigning a home and containerizing is, um, are you going to be storing items in the garage or in a crawl space? Then they probably need to be waterproof containers, okay? Cardboard is not gonna work in the garage or somewhere where it might get damp. Um, the other half of that is if you have things that need to be protected like photos and books and things, those shouldn't be in the garage or somewhere damp like a crawl space either because obviously if water gets introduced to your photos or your books, it's gonna ruin them and we don't want that to happen, okay? So like I said, those two things kind of go together, how to keep, where to keep what you want and how to keep what you want. Um, other things to think about, 
like photos, okay? We would not want a big Rubbermaid container full of photos or books because it would be so heavy. So as you're looking to store things, make sure that you are um, using an appropriate sized container for stuff. So photos and books and things like that should actually be in pretty small containers because we wanna be able to protect them. And also we don't wanna fill it so full that we can't lift it ourselves. Okay, so those are just some things to think about. Um, also, when you're assigning a home and containerizing, please remember that candles melt and snow globes, snow globes can freeze and burst. This is both firsthand knowledge. Learn from our mistakes, our first home. Apparently the attic got really hot the first summer and all of our candles melted. So that was fun to find the second Christmas. Um, and uh, a family member moved back to Michigan and kept all of the Christmas decor in um, the garage or in the barn. And all of the snow globes had burst, frozen and burst by the time they brought them in at Christmas. So that was very unfortunate. But again, just think about what you have to store and where you want to store it, if it needs to be protected, et cetera. Okay. So we have talked about sorting. We've talked about purging. We've assigned a home to our stuff and we've containerized our stuff, okay? The last step is actually the lifelong step, okay? That is equalizing in terms of Julie Morgenstern. I call it maintenance. And maintenance is forever, sorry. Maintenance is forever. Um, now, maintenance is a whole lot easier than the actual organizing process. So you got that going for you. That's a good thing, okay? But maintenance is forever. Maintenance is ongoing. Maintenance is checking your kitchen cabinets before you go to the grocery so you only buy the food that you need this week okay maintenance is having a regularly scheduled closet review every season or so so that you don't rebuy things um, and that you keep things that you've decided you're not going to use moving on to somebody else who will appreciate them um, Maintenance is every season when you move, you put away the snowblower and you take out the lawnmower, we hope, right? And we better not use that snowblower again. April 4th, maybe, maybe, hopefully not, maybe. Um, but we kind of tweak and put things away the right way and then that holds us off until October when we make the swap again, okay? Um, Maintenance is having, you know, regularly scheduled drop-offs at the donation place of choice. Um, it means that every August when my local public library has a book sale, we go through our books and we donate a couple books and that is to benefit the programs. And that's a great motivator because we love it at our library, right? Who wouldn't? Absolutely. So, Having those regularly scheduled ways for things to be on their way um, is um, just as important as the hard work to go into organizing, okay? So maintenance means um, it's ongoing. It's little bits and pieces. It doesn't have to be all day, every day. I did read a great quote the other day. It was, talk, it was an article about um, mini houses, micro houses, the tiny houses. I would love one. I don't think anybody else in my family will ever like that idea, but I do. Um, but what they did say was a house doesn't keep itself, meaning your house isn't going to tidy itself. I wish that would be awesome, right? That would be awesome, but it's unlikely. So we do need to take care of that, those maintenance steps once in a while and putting things away so um, we actually get to use the benefits of the hard work that we have done. So. Um, like I said, maintenance is less and it's easier, but it is lifelong, um, either in little bits and pieces or, you know, bigger projects a couple times a year just to make things, uh, make sure that things are still going the way they're supposed to go. Okay, I went beyond 30 minutes, but Stephanie, you told me I could, and so I did. I hope that's okay. Um, I have two other public service announcements for me, and then I'm going to tag back over. To Stephanie at Blue Island Public Library. Um, first of all, again, if you want to check out my website, peaceofmindpo.com, there's a little drop down menu when you go there, um, and it has a if you'd like to subscribe, um, it swings. Sorry, that's what made me think of <laughs> the little sign. Um, if you'd like to subscribe to my newsletter, it goes out every, uh, it's supposed to go out every 
Tuesday, but I've been sending it out more regularly because people have been asking me questions. Um, so I would love to have that information from you if that would be helpful. Um, you can also do it on your phone. You can text um, peace of mind, all one word, to 22828 to get started. Um, and then it'll just ask you for your email address and it'll subscribe you like that.